Good evening. Welcome to Grace Point and welcome to the Wednesday night Bible study. Glad to have you with us tonight. We're going to be talking about prayer and we're going to be talking about the six different types of prayer that we pray. In John chapter 15, verse 7, Jesus told his disciples, he said, if you abide in me and if my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. Now that scripture sounds like a great promise and it is a great promise. A lot of folks kind of take that and say, wow, if, uh, if I just pray, that means that God's going to give me whatever I want. Uh, that's not what this particular verse is saying. That's not what any of God's uh, scriptures tell us. He said, and there are some verses and some key words in there that preclude answer to prayer. He said, if you abide in me and if my words abide in you, then ask whatever you desire. So what does it mean to abide in Christ? Literally, it means to live with him. When you abide somewhere, it means where you live. That's where you stay. Uh, wherever you spend all of your time, wherever you spend all of your thoughts, wherever you spend all of your energy, that's where you abide. Then the scripture says, not only should you you be abiding in him, but the scripture says that his words also abide in you. That means that God's word lives in your heart. It lives in your mind. It lives in your life. It's played out in your life. So he says, if you're abiding in me and my words abide in you, then ask whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. That means that we're going to be asking for God's will and God's design to be done. And he says, when you ask for my design to be done, it's going to happen. A little later on, we're going to discuss the six different types of prayer. But first, I thought we could take a look, uh, just a, a, a small and brief look at about what prayer actually is. So here's a few important aspects about prayer. First and foremost, Prayer is a relationship. Uh, it's built on a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not uh, something that we do just to, to throw up towards heaven, but it's supposed to be based on your understanding, based on your knowledge of, based on your love for our Lord Jesus Christ. So prayer is a love relationship with Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20 Jesus said this, and he was talking to the church, so you understand its context. He's speaking to the church, so he's speaking to Christians, and he says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him, and I will dine with him, and he with me. That message to believers is that if we will just listen for the Lord, He's already knocking on our heart's door. He wants to come in. He wants to spend time with us. He wants to visit and talk. So he wants that prayer relationship. He says he's knocking at the door. If we will hear his voice, so we have to listen for his voice, hear his voice and open the door, he said he's going to come in to us. In John chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus also said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. How do we have Jesus come to us? Well, the first and best way that we know how is in prayer. Certainly, we read his word. We meditate on his word. But one of the greatest and closest ways that we can get to God is through prayer. And he says, if you love me, if you keep my word, he said, we will come to you and make our home in you. Isn't that an incredible and wonderful promise? See, God seeks a love relationship with everybody. He wants a love relationship with his children. He wants us to know him, and he wants uh, He wants to know us. He wants to know them, and he wants to be known by them. He seeks what we call then from that original verse, an abiding of us with him. Now, there's also a special promise for prayer, and that's when two or more people agree in prayer together. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 19 and 20, Jesus said this. He says, again, I say to you, that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst of them. 
Now, don't you love that promise? That is an incredible and wonderful promise. And the, one of the first promises from that scripture is that God's presence is promised wherever two or more people are gathered in his name. That's for prayer. That's for worship. That's for fellowship. Whatever you do when you gather together in the name of God, he promises that he's going to be there with them. The second part of that is that he gives a greater authority in prayer to those who are united in prayer. So where two or more people to get gather together in his name to pray, there's greater authority. So folks, by all means, we not, ought not only to be praying, but we need to be praying together and agreeing together to our Lord. Now, another important promise from God is found in Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3. That scripture tells us, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. I love that scripture, and a lot of people call that God's telephone number. Why? Because he says, call to me and I will answer you. If we call, God promises that he will answer. Call his phone number. It's JR 33.3, Jeremiah 33.3. If we call, he says he will answer, and he's going to show us great and mighty things. Now, lastly, before we move on to the six types of prayer, what's the purpose of prayer? Uh, what's the whole idea and why do we need to pray? God wants us to pray because he wants to build a love relationship with him. Now, he wants a love relationship with us because he wants to uh, identify with us and he wants us to identify with him. Now, we identify with him because we need to be more like him. We need to follow him. So prayer is not just presenting God with your grocery list or your wish list or your Christmas list. Prayer is actually bending your will to be more like God. God wants us to identify with him by working with him through prayer. Now, working on what? On you. Uh, God doesn't need to be worked on. God's already perfect. So when he's working, he's working on us or he's working on the circumstances around us. He wants to work on me and he wants to work on you. So many people think that prayer is changing God's mind to do what you want him to do or what somebody, anybody wants him to do. Well, what if two different people are praying for uh, over the same matter, but they want two different outcomes, which is God's will, uh, quite possibly and more probably neither. The understanding is that when we pray, we are supposed to be looking to God to yield ourselves to him, to listen to him, not just to speak to him, but to hear back from him and to let our spirits match up with his. Again, so many people think that uh, prayer is changing God's mind to their way, and actually it's just totally the opposite. It's molding our heart to be like his. Now, that makes a lot more sense when you understand where our desire to pray comes from. Where does prayer begin? Did you know that prayer does not begin with you? Have you ever, have you ever been thinking, oh, well, uh, I need to pray? Well, I'm going to tell you, that thought didn't come from you. Did you know that if there are any spiritual thoughts in you, God's Word tells us that those thoughts come from Him. So prayer does not begin with us. Prayer begins with the Holy Spirit within us because God's word reminds us that we don't seek God on our own. We only come to him and seek him when his Holy Spirit calls us, when his Holy Spirit moves our heart. So when God's Holy Spirit wants us to be more like him, which I believe is all the time, he moves our hearts to want to pray and to, to be with him and to spend time with him. So now that we've covered a few of those basics, let's move to the six kinds of prayers that we can actually pray. There are six different kinds of prayer, four kinds of responding prayers, and two different kinds of asking prayers. So what is a responding prayer? A responding prayer is seeing an attribute of God, and then we respond to it. For instance, the first kind of responding prayer is confession. Confession is when we respond to God in his holiness. We see the holiness of God and we realize our own sin. And when we realize our own sin, we have a desire then to confess to God, to say, God, I am not worthy. I am not worthy of talking to you, much less being in your presence. Uh, but our heart's desire it then is to yield to him. 
A good example of that is from Psalm 51, verses 1 through 3, when David prayed and he said, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me against you, Lord, and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Now, when did David come to that conclusion that what he had done was so terrible and so evil? When he began to listen to the word of God again, when he began to, to hear God moving in his heart, so when he experienced the holiness of God in his life again, God's holiness convicted David of his sin, and God's holiness convicts us of our sin as well. So the, th the key thought to confession is agreeing with God, agreeing with God that our sin is sin and that it's terrible. Now, why is that so important? Because we love God. And because God loves us, he wants us to return to him. And in order to return to him, we have to agree with God. Right here, let's stop just a minute and talk about another promise that God has given us in prayer. And it uh, fits in here because it's a promise about confession of sin. In 1 John 1, 9, God's word tells us if we confess our sins... God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So there's an if-then statement there. If we confess our sins, then God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from part. No, he says cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in order to return to God, once we have sinned and been separated from him, we must agree about his concept of sin about his concept of my sin, that it's ugly, that it separated us, that it hurts him, and that he cannot tolerate our sin. He loves us, but he hates our sin. And so he says we must confess it. And when we confess it and we ask for forgiveness, God's word tells us there in 1 John 1, 9, that he is faithful to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. But only when we agree with him that our sin has separated us, that it's ugly, that it's bad. Only then can we be made right with him. Now, the second uh, responding prayer is praise. And praise is responding to God's wonderful attributes. Uh, we see God's attributes and we just can't help but, but calling out to him and saying, God, you're so wonderful. You're so great. So many songs are written uh, about praise and they're about God's attributes. We, we sing a song, uh, Great is the Lord. We sing a song about uh, God is love. So many different songs we sing are praise songs. But praise is responding to his attributes. Psalms chapter 145, verses 3 through 7 say this, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts, and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. Folks, that's a response to God. That is a responding prayer to God showing us his attributes. You see, God shows himself to us because he wants us to know him. Remember we said that he wants a love relationship. He wants a love relationship with you. So God shows himself to us because he wants us to know him. And as we grow in knowledge of him, we understand and we see and we know his attributes. And the more we know his attributes, the more we know what he's like. And the more we know what he's like, the more we want to praise him. Praise lifts up his attributes. We, we sing back to him who he is and what he's done. Praise helps us to focus on who he is and what he's done. So the key word when it comes to praise and this responsive pair of praise is celebration. We are not celebrating who we are. We're celebrating who God is and we're celebrating what God has done for us. Celebrating God 
is praise. Now there is a third uh, responsive prayer, and that third response to prayer is worship, and it's worshiping in prayer. Worship prayer is, is responding to God's attribute of glory. In Psalms chapter 42, verses 1 and 2, the scripture says, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. Worship is a drawing of God into his glorious presence where we want to give him what he is worthy of. How can we ever give God what he's worthy of? We, we have no ability to give God above who he is and what he is. So God settles for proper worship. God settles for us to give him what glory we can and what we're able to give to him to the best of our ability. When God reveals himself, he displays his glory. His acts and his creations reveal his glory. And a heart that belonged to God want to give him that something back. And that something that he's so desiring as us of us is the heart of worship. You see, now you say, well, what's the difference between that and praise? Well, praise can be celebrative. Praise can be loud. Praise can be marching. Praise can be the drums. It can be banging on the cymbals. But worship is more intimate than praise. It's not just yelling and screaming and saying, yo, God, like we do at a ball game. But it could be. But worship is more of, of that intimate love time, you know, where we're just saying, God, I adore you. God, I love you. God, I honor you. It's just so much more intimate than praise. If where the word for praise and the key word for praise is celebration, the key word for worship is reverence and reverencing God to say, God, I realize who you are. I am so unworthy to be before you. But in my prayers, God, I am going to recognize you for your worthship of my love. The fourth response in prayer is thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a response to God's riches. All the things that God gives to you and to us uh, together and even individually. Uh, it is giving God thanksgiving and just saying, Lord, you're, you're so good. I, I just give you thanksgiving and praise and, and glory and honor. Uh, it's giving God his due thanksgiving when he, when, he gives, when he gives us all that he gives. In Psalms chapter 136, so many psalms uh, are songs of thanksgiving and praise, but Psalms 136 is a particularly appropriate uh, scripture here. In verses 1 through 6, verse 23 and 24, and verse 26, uh, the whole chapter is so filled with these, but those in particular, let me just read those to you. Uh, David says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. And after every time he says, Give thanks, he shares this response from the congregation, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And your response would be, For his mercy endures forever. After every response, try it with me, won't you? Oh, give thanks to God. Our Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of hosts, for his mercy endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his mercy endures forever. To him who by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endures forever. To him who laid out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endures forever. Who remembered us in our lowly state, his mercy endures forever. And rescued us from our enemies, for his mercy endures forever. And the last one that we're going to read, Oh, give thanks to the God of heaven. Why? His mercy endures forever forever. You see, God is merciful and God is good. God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. His word tells us so, and we know by the, our testimony here in this world, the things that we see, that it's true. God wants you to experience 
the abundant life that he has for you. He wants you to have a good and wonderful life. He didn't try to hold it back. He wants you to have everything and more. The scripture says, uh, shaken down and pressed together. In other words, all that you can possibly pack into the package of your life, God wants you to have. He's the giver of every good and perfect gift. You see, thanksgiving is an attitude of gratitude. So the key word for the response of giving thanks is gratitude. Bring grateful to God for what he's given. You know, when you do something wonderful for somebody and they don't even acknowledge it, doesn't it hurt your feelings some? Even if you gave it because you cared for them and you love them, it is always so nice and it warms our heart and it makes us feel so good when someone acknowledges our gift. God wants us to do the same. He wants us to be grateful for all that he gives to us. So that covers the four responsive prayers, responding to God's attributes. And then there are two kinds of asking prayers. The two kinds of asking prayers begin with petition. And petition is asking for yourself. Uh, I think we know this one pretty well. We really don't have to be taught too much about how to ask for things for ourselves when it comes to selfishness anyway. But we really do need to be careful and ask God about how we ask for things for ourselves so that we get a spiritual uh, enrichment rather than just a worldly enrichment. So petition is asking for me. It's asking for you. In Matthew chapter 7, our Lord Jesus Christ gave us a recipe for asking. Uh, verses 7 through 11 of Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. And I love the way he describes then the way that God likes to give. In verse 9 he says this, he says, Or what man is there among you if his son asks for bread, is going to give him a rock? Or if he asks for a fish, he's going to give him a snake? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your own children, how much more will your heavenly Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask of him? So God's word tells us that we're supposed to ask in his name, but he says, ask. I want you to ask according to my name. Ask great things because I will show you great and mighty things. In John chapter 14, verse 14, Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So that doesn't mean the abracadabra of prayers where we say, uh, uh, I want a million dollars abracadabra, or we say, I want a million dollars in Jesus' name. And what he says in my name, when he says in my name, what he's saying is in my spirit, according to my word, according to my heart, according to my will. He says, if you ask anything in that manner, I'm going to do it. In John chapter 15, verse 7, he said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. Remember that word abide means living in. So he says, if you live in me and my words live in you, ask whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. In John chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus said, until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy will be full. I think there's a lot of people that are not asking in the name of Jesus Christ. They're asking in their own name. They're asking in their own desires. They're asking out of their own selfishness when God is trying to give them something greater and better. How many times have we asked for something that was not what God wanted us to have? Maybe it wasn't good for us, or it was outright bad for us, or it's not where God wanted us to be, and we didn't get it because it wasn't in the will of God. So scripture tells us, abide in Christ, listen to the Lord, watch to see where God is at work, join him there. And as you join him there, pray and say, God, what is it that you want to give me? Listen to him, ask him, meditate. And when he reveals to you what he wants, pray for that and pray for it with boldness. Pray for it, asking God, because he says it shall be done for you. Ask and you will receive and your joy, he said, is going to be full. Now, the second type of asking prayer is intercession. Intercession is asking and praying for others. Uh, you may recall in 
the New Testament, Paul seemed to do a lot of this. Jesus prayed a lot for others. But Paul prayed also reminding us that we're supposed to pray for others. And he did this uh, on a regular basis. Let me give you an example from Scripture. In Ephesians chapter 3, uh, verses 16 and following, uh, Paul prayed this prayer. He said, I pray that out of God's glorious riches he may strengthen you, strengthen you with power through his Holy Spirit in your inner being so that Christ might dwell up in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Isn't that a wonderful prayer to pray for somebody else? I know a lot of us have been praying lately uh, for our nation. They, we've been praying for the world. We've been praying uh, for our president, President Trump. We've been praying for those who are surrounding him in leadership. We've been praying for great decisions and good decisions to help us through this uh, uh, COVID-19 crisis. Uh, there have been a lot of people that are praying now that haven't prayed before. I want to remind you, there are six different kinds of prayer. And let's start with all those responsive prayers, prayers that lift up glory to God. And then after we finish all those prayers where we respond to God's attributes, let's lift up prayers for others. Nothing wrong with praying for yourself. Pray for yourself and pray that your heart would be right. Pray that your sins are forgiven because when your heart is right, when your soul is right, when your joy is returned because you're right with God, we all pray much better for other people as well. And certainly when we get there, pray for others. Pray for people that are in difficulty. Right now, uh, on our hearts here at, at Grace Point, we have been praying for our, our members. We've been praying for many people who uh, uh, know others who are in the workforces out there, all of our law enforcement, all of our uh, EMTs, our nurses, and our doctors who are out on the front lines. We have been praying so much for them. We've been praying for God's protection. We've been praying for God to keep to keep their bodies whole and uh, well. We've been praying for their strength. We've been praying for their peace. That's an intercessory prayer. And of all times now is certainly a great time for intercessory prayer. I'd like to close tonight's uh, study time. Uh, with a thought about the end of the scripture that we read just a few moments ago. We were reading from Ephesians chapter 3, and I'd like to read the following script, two scriptures to that passage that we did read, and that is Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Scripture says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or all that we can imagine, and according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ through all generations, forever and forever. And it concludes, amen. So that, my friend, is a prayer. Let's say it again. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all I could ever think or ask, according to your power, Lord God, that's at work within me, that's at work within you, that's at work within your church, to you be the glory inside of your church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations, forever and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. The Lord bless you. We'll see you on Sunday. We're going to have another service online. We're going to be moving to the fourth rule of the Red Seas rules. And I look forward to sharing more with you then. God bless.